Hi, this is Bay McFarlane with Mary's Advocates, and we are introducing you to Matthew Johnston, who's going to be talking about a case that's going on right now in New York State where a party in a no-fault divorce is getting ready to do an appeal where they're saying it was unconstitutional to force a no-fault divorce on the family. So, Matthew, say hi. Hi, everyone. Um, hi, Nate. Hi, thanks. The reason no-fault divorce is so offensive to anyone with a traditional Christian faith or even other faiths is that when parties get married, they agree to certain things, like support, maintaining one household, not committing adultery, being sexually faithful. And if one party violates those marriage promises so severely, it could be a legitimate reason for separation of spouses, also a civil divorce in the state system. But what's happening with no-fault is innocent parties are having no-fault divorce forced on them. So, Matthew, can you address that from your perspective, your faith perspective? How's your mom think about all this? Sure. And, um, I think you just said parties, but the parties are actually my parents. I'm the son of the, the, the two parties, and so, uh, you know, this is a very kind of personal thing to me. Um, and, uh, you know, I was raised in a Christian home. My mother um, grew up uh, in a Christian home. My father didn't, but you know, uh, say that he converted to faith, and so um, there are a lot of principles surrounding family, and uh, you know the, uh, the the responsibilities surrounding what um, what is crucial to a marriage, and you know what is crucial between family members, and so um, that responsibility, although it was you know sort of talked about and preached in the home, um, that responsibility hasn't been held to account because of this no fault statute. So right now, you told me what's going on is. Your mom knows she's in a situation where she needs financial support, and the state courts of New York have been set up for a century to help a woman like your mom, but your dad's coming forward and saying he wants a no-fault divorce. So what's your mom doing in the lower court, and what happened? So throughout her litigation, and she was pro se for most of it, so she didn't have representation, but for the most part of, of the litigation as well as for the trial, uh, she was insistent on uh, if there was going to be a divorce, that it had to be based on false grounds. She made that very clear, and there was a lot of discourse between you know the court and the opposition and my mother about that. So it was a, a central theme to this case, um, and uh, you know we didn't know until the, the decision was actually made. You know I assumed that they would probably take no fault over all the others, but uh, uh, but my mom didn't necessarily think that, and, and we didn't know until the, the decision and order was actually made. And so um, when it when it came that. Uh, the court determined that the marriage should be dissolved through a no-fault divorce, a unilateral no-fault divorce. Um, my mother appealed, uh, is appealing right now on constitutional grounds, and so we are um, right now tirelessly uh, trying to write the, the appeal brief and, and submit that to um, the appellate court in Albany, New York. And you contacted me maybe a year or so ago, I don't exactly remember, but then you contacted me again once this decision was made, because you're on deadlines right now and you asked me if we have any friends as Mary's advocates with any people who are expert in constitutional law that could either help you write your brief and prepare for the appellate, or if we had a lawyer who's a constitutional law expert, if he could weigh in and even do a friend of the court brief, an amicus brief. What are some of the constitutional principles, and explain it to the people who don't know any of this law stuff, what are some of the principles that are in play here? Sure. So, um... Because my mother is focused on sort of the financial distribution aspect of the appeal, I'm, I'm primarily focused on the constitutional aspect, and so I've done a lot of research and, and I'm actually writing um, the majority of, of the brief for her um, in regards to the constitutional issues, and there's lots of things um, involved and in, in at play here. Um, <clears throat> so there's the issue of, um, you know, her, her religious expression, her, her right to uh, exercise her faith through the provisions that exist in New York, which, you know, include... Abandonment and adultery. Um, by and, that, let me interrupt uh, you. By that, you mean that New York, when they introduced no fault divorce, they kept the fault based grounds on the law book. So that judge could have, with proof, just as easily issued a divorce based on abandonment or based on adultery, right? It's a valid. It's a valid provision in New York State that exists, and that's what my mother uh, was going for. So. Um, that was ignored. Um, and how does that play into her religion? Can you elaborate on that a little? Sure. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, the idea of family responsibility and being held accountable when, when things go wrong. And I think 
I think the misconception by a lot of people, um, especially our, you know, even in our church and, and Christian community, is that you know, divorce is nobody's fault, you know, or it's both people's fault, or people have, you know, both sides have, you know, some kind of issue. And, you know, I understand that, you know, conflict and, and problems do arise from both sides and miscommunication and all that kind of stuff. But it, when it comes to the divorce and some of the, the, the major issues that come to play, including, you know, um, very clearly one-sided emotional abuse, financial abuse, um, and other abuses, it's very clear, at least from my perspective, uh, whose fault that is, and and that needs to be held to, to account. And, and and one party is very um, the, the party seeking the divorce here, which is which is my father, um, is responsible for for this decision and and the protections that um, should should ensure my my mother's uh, sustenance for the future. So it's very important that that he, he becomes he he comes to account for that and and. Um, and that's very fundamental to, I think, a lot of Christian faiths. And so uh, her inability or her the, coer- the coercion of her not being able to uh, exercise her faith and, and being able to bring my father to account because of his adultery, because of his abandonment, not, not letting her come back into the family home, I think is really crucial in terms of being able to exercise her faith Okay. through this divorce proceeding. Okay, there were some other constitutional principles you were rattling off earlier with me. What, what were those? Yeah, so there's the uh, Fifth Amendment due process clause, which is the right to a trial. Uh, New York has determined that the intention of the no-fault statute is to eliminate trials, and so, um, and, and hence, you know, really uh, uh, impairing the, the Fifth Amendment, amendment to have the right to a, a, a trial. And so while okay, we did have a, a, a judge trial, a judicial trial, sorry, um, it was primarily on financial grounds, not, not, um, Okay, so that's, that's a right to a trial that's being right. violated. Right, and then the there's, um, there's the equality under the law clause in the 14th Amendment of the Constitution, which basically provides that uh, both parties should, should have equal standing uh, and equal consideration under the law. And that's not being done in unilateral divorce, uh, unilateral no fault divorce, because um, my father's decision to do unilateral no fault trumps uh, any consideration of my mom's request for other provisions. And that happens everywhere besides New York. Were there any exactly. others that you were thinking about using for the Constitution to make a complaint? Sure, I think that uh, consent is, a, is is clearly understood to be crucial for. Uh, entering into marriage and yeah. with it itself, um, New York has determined that the validity of marriage is based on consent. Uh, so, if you can divorce without that consent, it's an intrusion of the government to make that decision for the parties. And so, it wasn't a decision between two people, it was a decision that the government, uh, my father's, let's say, proposed and, my, and the government decided. Let me say that a different way. If okay. your dad said out in a field, I'm marrying your mom by himself, that obviously would not be a marriage. They need two people saying that we intend marriage, and that's the consent part that makes the marriage. But now, when we're saying we're going to end the marriage, basically your dad can announce to whoever that he's ending his marriage, and the court says, okay. And that's how. That's why? Yeah, exactly. And uh, Yeah, exactly. Okay. Any other ones? Because we're, we're going to wrap up pretty soon. Sure. The last one that might be intriguing is the uh, uh, contract clause within the Constitution. And the reason why that's really fascinating is because it's already been determined that it doesn't apply to uh, marriage and divorce because the states have the right to regulate and control marriages. However, um, the case that they cite, if they... If they include the following sentences, it actually the Supreme Court justice um, said that in cases where the state impairs the contract, it could be understood to include marriage and divorce. And he said that <clears throat> when there comes the time where only one party has to make the deci- when only one party has to make the decision to uh, get a divorce, that would become time when the question of no fault becomes a constitutional issue. And this was back in the 1800s. So, um, but it is the, it is the uh, 
one of the Supreme Court cases that people still use to the state to justify why um, it doesn't apply to marriage, but actually, in fact, it could. Because one of the things that we show on Mary's Advocates website is the Constitution restricts the state from making any laws infringing on the intended obligations of parties in a contract. So if two parties go into a marriage contract with the understanding that we're going to support each other in a, a unified household and we're only going to separate under grave circumstances and the person who's the cause of that breakup is going to be held as much as possible accountable to uphold their other obligations and be separated, that's what people go into marriage understanding and then with no fault, the state just like rips the contract out from underneath the parties. Yeah, and I'll, I'll try to wrap things up, but the, the, the problem is that uh, New York State and I'm sure others have said that marriage is a unique kind of contract where that doesn't apply. But but if we look at it a bit deeper, there is precedent for why it could apply, yes. Because I've even heard in some of these 1800 cases that the, the higher court's ruling was that marriage is a special kind of contract where if both parties wanted to get out... The state has interest in preventing them from ending their contract without consequences. Exactly. And New York, I think, calls it sweet generé or generous or something like this. And it's the legal distinction of, of marriage being a unique contract that should be protected more, not less, yes. than other contracts. All right. Well, thanks, Matthew. So where we are right now is we are looking for any constitutional law experts who can touch base with you. And those can even be self-studied folks. And if there is any constitutional law experts who are lawyers, you'd love to have an amicus brief, friend of the court. And you are on deadlines right now. So if people want to contact you, they can go to Mary's Advocates, and I'll put them in touch with you. Absolutely. That All sounds right. great. Okay. Thanks, Matthew. I'm going to stop. Thank you.